The first two weeks in August are spent in service of Girl Scouts at Lago Maggiore. I admit, when a few years ago I was first asked to assist one of their groups as a priest, I was unsure. The age group in the Catholic Association Scout d'Europe spends 12 to 17. I have two sisters and I probably wouldn't shock anyone, my sisters included, if I said that this can be a difficult age. And then there was this huge gap. At 12, some are still children. At 17, some are young women. But the experience turned out to be a really good one. I can only imagine how difficult it must be to grow into a woman in the age of Instagram and TikTok. I was edified how the group and leadership took things on. The women who led the group, most of them in their 20s, seemed all really grounded. Maybe because most of them had grown up in the country. What surprised me more, however, was the dynamics between the girls. Rather than forming age-related cliques, the older ones really took on the role of older sisters and even mothers when needed. They were old enough at 16, 17 to understand responsibility and young enough to be looked up to as attainable role models by their 13 and 14 year olds. I'm not suggesting that there were no conflicts. I was just impressed at how they were generally handled and resolved, at least in my somewhat outside experience. That being said, after the two weeks with the girls, I looked forward to another, more adventurous camp organized by the young men. I already knew most members of the group. This time they invited me to traverse Mallorca, an island in the Mediterranean that otherwise I would have never visited. It is known for two things, binge drinking tourists from Germany and a bunch of English under the influence of alcohol. Both of these groups celebrating at opposing ends of the island. Turns out, however, that there is a beautiful hike traversing the entire mountain range in the north. All that left me was just a few precious days in the hermitage this month. To harvest, and for the second time to try and tame the tomatoes that were now fully out of control.
I'm at a stage where I address some of the issues of the house, issues that were of no major concern when I first came here. I was initially granted three years, and really only had three months to fix the place up so I could work in it. I figured if I had to sell after three years, someone else would do as they wanted. Then I was allowed to continue on, and so I made a project list. One of the items was the metal entrance door. Metal doors are not the best for cold winter days. It had been no issue for the previous owners who had come up here only in the summer. My initial quick fix had been to build shutters to keep more heat in. That improved the situation considerably, but it also robbed me of natural light downstairs. So I needed a new door for the old frame.
Other small projects around the house are more cosmetic in nature. They are a good balance for the computer work. For one of them, I wanted to replace the half-rusted metal roofing above the stairs of the balcony. The way it had been built, it also offered little protection for the balcony itself, with spray drenching the floorboards. I thought that wood shingles might be a nice touch. And for working on them, one of the tools, useful also in other projects, was a shaving horse. So, in the one week I was on the mountain in August, I grabbed some wood from the wood pile and went to it.
There is a famous story of the great thinker and theologian Augustine of Hippo, who was trying to comprehend the mystery of the one God. Christianity, coming from Judaism and understanding itself as extending the call to the covenant, 
from this limited group in the Middle East to encompass all of humanity, believes in the same one God. But in the particular revelation at its center, Christ also appears divine, as does the Spirit of God through his works and agency. Christians speak of the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But how is this to be understood? Augustine now wondered that if man was made in the image of God, whether the image could not be helpful in understanding its source. Now, what makes man to be made in the image of God is probably not his physical body. We share much with other creatures in that way. What makes man special is his rational nature, his capacity for thought and will, with which he can perceive the true and incline to the good. Augustine looked at scripture. The Gospels themselves speak of Christ as the Word of God made flesh, and of the Holy Spirit as the love of God poured into our hearts. Those were no passing remarks. And inspired by this revelation, Augustine formulated what is called the psychological analogy. When we look at the human soul, and in particular its higher, rational part, we find an interesting interplay between the intellect and the will. When I perceive an object through my senses, then my intellect forms a mental image of the object, a concept. If I see a mountain, for example, then I will have a mental image, likeness and concept of the mountain in my mind. If that concept is something good and desirable, then the will inclines me towards that mountain. This is more or less how the interaction between the intellect and the will works. The intellect forms an image or concept, a mental word, and if the thing is desirable, the will inclines us to love that object. Let's leave the mountains and go a step further. What if we don't reflect on some landscape, but on ourselves? Well, the intellect forms an image of ourselves, and if what is perceived is good, the will inclines us to love ourselves. Augustine now took this mental process and related it to the one God. God knows himself, thereby forming a perfect image of himself, a concept that wholly expresses himself. Hence the perfect image is called the Son, while its source is called the Father. The Son being the perfect self-knowledge of God is also referred to as the Logos, the eternal word, in which God, as it were, self-expresses himself to himself. What is the difference between the Father and the Son? The only difference is that the one generates while the other is generated. The only difference is their relation. So the Father knows himself in the Son and the Son in the Father. Because both are goodness and truth itself, they incline towards each other in love. And this is the coming forth of the Holy Spirit, who is indeed the very love between the Father and the Son. This is how St. Augustine tried to explain the Trinitarian life of the one God who knows and loves himself. He understood, of course, that we are severely limited using such attempts at understanding God. We cannot but think in temporal ways and by way of parts added onto each other. Neither is true in God. And what Augustine is describing here did not happen a long time ago. God the Father did not rest alone at some point in the past before generating the Son. The Trinitarian dynamic of God knowing and loving himself is eternal. Nor do any of the things we speak of here imply parts in God. We, as humans, cannot but divide things up. It is how our minds work. But in God it is all one. God has no parts. The three are one. The one is three. All right, but how to understand this really? Well, this brings us to the famous story mentioned in the beginning. It is said that one day Augustine stood on the beach contemplating the mystery of God. That is not a bad location to contemplate God, but that is besides the point. Augustine then noticed a little child. He dug a hole and ran back and forth between it and the ocean, trying to fill the hole with water. After a while, Augustine asked the child what he was trying to do. 
The child responded, I am emptying the sea into this hole. When the saint pointed out the impossibility of this venture, the child replied, I will sooner empty the sea into this hole than you will manage to get the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity into your head. This story touches on an important aspect. When we speak of the infinite, we can only do so in negative terms. We as finite beings cannot positively comprehend infinitude. That is even why we call it the infinite, the not finite. Finite things we can understand. Of the infinite we can only speak in terms of what it is not. It is not finite. Something of this applies to God. If we say that we comprehend God, this would mean that God, the infinite, can fit into our finite minds, making our minds even greater than God. That cannot be the case, however. Si comprehendis non est Deus is a line by the very same Augustine. Loosely, it means, if it fits into your mind, it is not God. All of this is already indicated in Jewish history. Among the Ten Commandments we find, Thou shalt not make yourself a graven image. It is a commandment against idolatry, but it is also a commandment that should caution us in a more general way. God goes beyond our understanding. Images, even mental ones, we have of God may illustrate an aspect of God, but the image never exhausts the reality. God reveals himself to man so that we can know something, but even then it is according to the mode of our understanding and our capacity, not because we can grasp the essence of the divine. We are not blind, but we need to be aware that there is more than meets the eye. That makes theology, in my mind, fascinating. It would be a puny God if he could fit into my limited understanding. I think we better preserve the sense of wonder, much like that of a child that steps into a garden marveling at the butterflies, or of a man gazing up to the myriad of stars.